the goal for today's lecture is to talk about downsampling and upsampling. Okay, so first we'll talk about downsampling and upsampling and uh, perhaps the, the theory part will be over within like 30 minutes. And then after that, uh, I know that some people came to my office hours for problem 7.38. So if you want to, uh, uh, if you want to learn more about how to solve problem 7.38, you can just stay back after the lecture is complete and I'll go over the problem and give you, provide you some hint about how to go around solving that problem. Okay, so, so what is the reason for downsampling and upsampling? So let's think about it. Uh, let's assume that I have a, I have a discrete time signal. Something like this. And I do the sampling of this particular signal. So when I do sampling, then of course I'm going to keep a few of those points will be zero. And I'll get a signal that looks like this. So this is my X of N. This is my XP of N, which is after sampling of X of N. Now, suppose you want to store this XP of N. So you want to either store or communicate this particular XP of N. Um, so, so how do you think you are going to store this particular, like what are the different ways by which you can store this time series? Can someone tell me or give me some ideas about how to store this XP of N? I want to store it in my computer or I want to communicate it to someone else. How should I go about doing it? Let me give it some some numbers. So this is one, this is 1.5, zero, 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 zero point seven five. That's the value of XP of N at different points in time. So how should I go about communicating or storing this time series? Any thoughts? Could you store it like as an array? As an array, okay. Great, so what should the value of, what should the uh, numbers in array be? One, zero, zero, one point five, zero, zero, point seven five. Perfect. So I can send you this array, I can store or communicate this array, which is basically some number padded with zeros and then some number with padded with zeros and some number. Is there a more intelligent way to store or communicate this array? Remove the uh, zero padding and then right. say that you have padding between each number. Right, exactly. So remove zero padding. So I only need to store two values. So n equals to two. And I need to say uh, one, 1 1.5 and 0 0.75. These are the two things I need to store. And, uh, and it will be, become clear because then I can go through this number n equals to two and this array. And I know that ev in between every two numbers, I have to insert two zeros. So when I'm retrieving that information, 
I can write it as 100, 1.500, 0.75, and so on. Okay, so this is a much more efficient way of storing this particular time series, time signal. Okay, and this process of removing this zero padding is known as downsampling. So downsampling is a process through which you sample the original signal and you remove some of the intermediate points um, and then just uh, have a much lower dimensional array to store or communicate that signal. Okay, so this is the process of downsampling. Now there is a similar or inverse process called upsampling where let's say you have a time signal like this. What you do is you upsample, wherein you add some intermediate points through either linear interpolation or cubic interpolation. So I'm doing a linear interpolation here. Okay, so I do some uh, either linear or cubic or some other form of interpolation, some other form of intelligent interpolation in between these signals. And I create an upsampled version of the original signal. Okay, so this is upsampling. This is exactly opposite of downsampling. Okay, now let's look at why this, uh, this upsampling and downsampling is important from, uh, say, this lecture's perspective. So in the previous lecture, I recorded my video, and this is the zoom properties, the, the property of the videos. So if you look at it, the frame width is 2736 pixels. So, so if I want to This is my video. So this is 2736 pixels. And the height is 1824. So this is 1824 pixels. Okay, so that's a lot of pixels of the order of, this is roughly 3000 pixels and this is roughly 2000 pixels. So about 6 million, roughly 6 million pixels is what the size of each each frame in the in the video is. That's a lot of pixels. And if I have to, let's say you have a bad internet connection, uh, transmitting the values of 6 million pixels is very, very complicated. Like it's going to take a lot of bandwidth and you will have extremely bad video quality. So if I go to YouTube, well, it's right here and I go to my lecture, let's say this is my lecture 28, and I look at the quality settings. So I have 1440 pixel, which is the very high, very large number of pixels that are streaming to your desktop. But there is also 144 pixel. So if you have extremely bad internet connection, uh, YouTube will automatically set the number of pixels to be 144 pixels for your video. Of course, the video quality will be bad, but at least you will be able to see everything in a, in a normal sequence and your video will not stop in between while it's buffering and getting information for, for uh, the, uh, getting information from the servers for uh, the entire video. So this, this is sort of, downsampling. So my original video was, actually it was higher definition than 1440p, but let's assume that my original video was 1440p. Then YouTube came up with this all sorts of downsampled version of the video. So as to make sure that the buffering is very well done under different types of internet connections. Okay, so that's the application of downsampling. Now, what about the application of upsampling? So let's consider the following situation. So you, you love signals and systems a lot. 
and you want to watch the video, the, the YouTube video of signals and systems on this latest Samsung Q900 8K television, which is an 85 inch television. Now let's look at this 85 inch television, right? So my YouTube video has, has a maximum quality of 1440p HD. And let's say you have excellent internet connection. So you can actually stream at this particular quality, video quality. However, if you look at the Samsung 8K video, Look at the number of pixels it has, 7680 horizontal pixels and 4320 vertical pixels, right? So total number of pixels is 33 million pixels in the screen itself. Um, now, now YouTube is sending you the information, but the number of pixels is actually only uh, 1440p um, quality. So 1080p quality is about 2 million pixels. Okay, so let's look at uh, the quality. So this is 1080p. So 1080p is about 2 million pixels. So YouTube is sending you roughly 2 million pixels per, um, per frame, uh, which, is, uh, which is a lot of, and there are about 15 frames per second. So there is about 30 million pixels being sent, 30 million pixel information being sent every second. But when you are displaying it on, on, on this $15,000 Samsung TV, it has to display on 33 million pixels. So it has to upsample the, uh, it has to upsample the entire uh, video in order for it, for you to have a good viewing experience on this large 8K television, 85 inch television. So apparently Samsung has some, some machine learning or whatever, some very cool technology to do the upsampling. So your pictures and everything will look very sharp, but, uh, but that's where upsampling is very, very useful. And uh, nowadays, a lot of these bars and restaurants, uh, they have these 85 inch screen for watching football games and whatnot. Um, and, and in all of those games, there is upsampling going on because the video quality is not that high that is streaming into the television. So they have to upsample it so that you can actually watch it very nicely on this 85 inch television. So next time when you are watching a football game on an 85 inch television, uh, actually you will be thinking about the signals and systems class more than actually watching the game. So that's the uh, application of upsampling. Now there is a question, is X2 and X4 supposed to be the same for upsampling? Oh, right, yeah, so this is, this is let's say one, 0 0.5, 0 0.8, no, 0 0.9. So this will be one, this will be in between, this is 0 0.5. This will be 0 0.7, this will be 0 0.9. So this is just a linear interpolation for doing the upsampling. But of course, in the case of images, the upsampling is done in a much more sophisticated manner. It's not just a linear interpolation. Okay, does that answer your question? Cool. Okay, so let's let's uh, think mathematically what's happening when you are doing downsampling and upsampling. So I have the original signal Xn that gets multiplied by an impulse strain Pn and I get Xpn. Um, so Xpn is the, is the uh, sample signal and it goes through a property called decimation and what I get is xb of n. So decimation is the downsampling part. This process is known as downsampling. So what is this process of decimation. So 
I have XP of N. is equal to xn if n is an integer multiple of capital N and it's zero otherwise okay and then we define this xb of n as xp of no uh let, let's let me try to xp of k should be equal to xp of k n yeah this is right okay where k is an integer which is also equal to x of kn. So then in our, our drawing of the figure up here, would we change the xb of n to xk of n, or are we just saying xk of n down here? So I'm just changing the time index here so that this n is distinct from this k. Um, okay. So so it's just the time index. I'm I'm not doing anything with respect to changing the values of the time signal itself. Okay. So let, let's look at an example. So this is my oh well the example is in the next slide. Uh, let's look at an example. So this is my x of n. And my capital N is equal to three here. So after every three time steps, I'm sampling the signal. Um, and so XB of N is removing all these zero values and we are getting a time signal, which is a much more compressed version of X of N. Okay. Any other questions so far? So this process is known as decimation. This is the decimation process. Now let's look at what's happening. So this is this is this is the decimation process in the time signal domain, time domain. So let's look at what's happening in the frequency domain. So I have Xn whose Fourier transform is X e raised to J omega. I have Xp of n whose Fourier transform is xp e raised to j omega, which is given by one over n summation k equals zero to n minus one.
now we need to look at what is happening to xb of e raised to j omega which is given by summation k equals to minus infinity to plus infinity So this is just the definition of Fourier transform of small xp. Let me substitute the expression for xp here. What else can we do? So I can write n equals to integer multiple of n xp of n e raised to minus j omega n over capital N. So I just replaced kn. I am replacing kn to be equal to small n. I just made a small substitution here. What's the value of XP of N at non integer multiple of capital N? Zero. Zero. So, right. So then I can just replace it for n going from minus infinity to plus infinity of xp of n e raised to minus j omega n over n. And that's because xp of n is zero for non integer multiple of capital N. Now this is pretty cool. This is actually my X capital P of E raised to J omega over N. Okay, so in the frequency domain, what I'm doing is I have this X of E raised to J omega. I am going to replicate this X E raised to J omega several times, at, actually N times, exactly capital N number of times. I'm going to replicate this in the frequency domain. And then after that, I'm going to just stretch the frequency axis, the omega axis, I'm just going to stretch it by a factor of N, capital N. And that's what will give me the frequency, the, the uh, Fourier transform of X sub B. Okay, and let's look at it in the figure. 
So this is my X of N, and this is my X of E raised to J omega, which is the Fourier transform of small x, the original signal. Then I did a, um, then I did a uh, sampling of X of N and I get XP of N, and I'm just replicating this X E raised to J omega after every interval. Like I'm just replicating it over the entire frequency domain. And then when I do the downsampling, this is the decimation process. So this process is decimation, this process is downsampling. So when I do the decimation, then I'm just stretching XB of um, the, the frequency axis going from XP to XB. And this is a process of downsampling. Now, many a times you would do some processing, signal processing with the downsampled signal. And then uh, after the processing is complete, you will then do this upsampling up procedure that we will discuss very shortly. So overall, the frequency response of the system is going to be quite different. But, uh, but so you can, again, like just like we did in the previous things, you have a sequence of systems in series interconnection, you can just multiply the Fourier transform of each of those systems, not the Fourier transform, the, imp, the frequency response of each of those subsystems, you get the frequency response of the end-to-end -end system. So typically when you look at this image recognition software, so for instance, if you're autonomous vehicle or not even autonomous vehicle, if you have a latest vehicle, and it's doing some sort of image processing to tell you whether you are within your lane or not within your lane. Uh, it will be using this downsampling procedure to figure out what the edges of the current uh, lane is uh, based on the white markings on the road. And then based on that information, it will tell you whether you are within the center of the lane or around the center of the lane, or you are sort of moving far away from the center of the lane. So this sort of uh, algorithm is used in lane keeping assist. That's the name of that technology, lane keeping assist. If you have any of the newer vehicles, you probably will have this feature in that vehicle. So that's where downsampling is useful. Now the upsampling is, oh, any question in the downsampling part? Okay, now there is the corresponding uh, inverse process called upsampling, which is you have a XB of N, so this is XB sub N. You have the original signal. Now you inserted certain number of zeros in between and you get XP of N. Now you have to pass it through a low pass filter ideal low pass or some interpolating filter interpolating interpolating filter and you get your x of n back and this is what's happening in the frequency domain you have this xb of e raised to j omega um, because you added this zero in between you have actually compressed the omega axis. So this becomes your XP of E raised to J omega. This is your XP E raised to J omega. And then you pass it through this low pass filter H of J omega. This is your low pass filter. And you are basically getting X of E raised to J omega. Now, of course, in this case, you're just using a regular low pass, ideal low pass filter, but you could potentially use any of the other interpolating filter like uh, uh, 
filter as well. Or you could even use some sort of signal processing algorithm within this particular block, and you will get some form of x of e raised to j omega. So, so if 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 I so let's consider the Mars rover, right? So Mars rover is sending information to Earth, right? So they are not using just a regular low pass filter to process the images that are coming from Mars. They probably are using a much more sophisticated algorithm to do the processing, the image processing to get the 8K or very high definition photographs of the surface of Mars, right? So it's not necessary that you pass it through a low pass filter in reality, you probably are using some AI algorithm, machine learning algorithm, or some other sophisticated algorithm to do the processing. As far as images are concerned, you know, so in image and audio, a lot of complicated algorithms are used to do the processing. Okay. So that's all I have for today. Um, we we this is this is it this is done we are done with chapter seven and now we will move on to chapter nine which is laplace transform and z transform so those are the two chapters left in this class um, any questions so far on the sampling uh, result if there are no questions i'll move on to problem 7.38 which is a assignment problem uh, which is due today or tonight Okay, so no questions. So those of you who want to uh, leave, you can leave. I'm going to talk about problem 7.38, which is something that many people came to my office hours to ask questions from. And also some people have uploaded their solutions, but their solutions are wrong. So uh, I think it's important that you understand what this uh, particular problem is trying to do. So this problem is about aliasing. I'm sure you all have read this problem. So the problem is as follows. I have a signal X of T, which is at a very high frequency. And there is no way I can come up with a hardware which can sample this signal at uh, two times omega M. So if I can't sample it at two times of omega M, but I can sample it around omega M, what can I do? So that's the question. That's that's what this question is all about. So you have a periodic signal, and you are going to sample. So the periodic signal has periodicity capital T. You will sample it with a periodicity of t plus delta. Okay, so this is t plus delta. Um, and then you want to pass it through a low pass filter, which is h of j omega equals to one for omega less than one over two t plus delta. And the question is, what is yt going to be equal to? Okay. And let's consider x of t is cos omega naught t plus uh, omega naught t plus theta, or let's say 2 pi over t multiplied by t plus theta. So in the problem, the question is for a plus b cos 2 pi over t multiplied by t plus theta, but I'm not taking those coefficients into account. I'm just going to do it for this particular signal. Okay, and I'm going to follow the procedure, uh, which was outlined in lecture 26, no, 27. Yeah. So in lecture 27, I had talked about what happens when you are not sampling at the Nyquist rate, uh, what kind of output do you get? So you remember this particular series of steps that we are taking, that we had taken in lecture 27. So I'm just going to go through these individual steps and I'll show you exactly how to get the answer for this particular signal. X of T is cos of two pi over T t plus theta. So let's first look at x of j omega. Well, let me rewrite x of t. Any, any question in the problem formulation? I hope everyone is clear about what problem we are trying to solve. 
I'm just solving the same problem, but with this particular XT, not the one given in question. So I'm going to write X of T as E raised to J two pi over T T plus theta minus J two pi over T T plus theta over two. So that gives me E raised to J theta over two, E raised to J two pi over T T plus e raised to minus j theta over two, e raised to minus j two pi over t multiplied by t. Okay, no, no problem so far. So my x of j omega is going to be e raised to j theta over two, two pi, omega minus two pi over t plus e raised to minus j theta over two, two pi delta omega plus two pi over t. Okay, so this is uh, the usual stuff from chapter four and chapter five, the Fourier transform stuff. Any questions so far? Okay, so I have this X of E raised to J omega, sorry, X of J omega. Now let's look at, Well, I want to get the XP. So this is my XP of T, which is after multiplying it by PT, the impulse strain. Uh, so let's look at what the XP of J omega looks like. So I'm going to go back to lecture 25, where we derived this expression. And XP of J omega is one over T. T is the sampling time, so it will become T plus delta. And this is capital X of J omega minus K omega S. So this is the uh, result we derived in lecture 25. I'm just going to use this result here. So one over T plus Delta summation K goes from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, X of J omega minus O. Yeah, this is fine, omega S. omega minus k two pi over t plus delta. Okay, so this is my XP of J omega. Now let's look at what we did in lecture 27. This is my lecture 25. Now I'm going to copy things from lecture 27. So in lecture 27, um, I wrote the whole expression of XPJ omega for K equals to minus one, K equals to zero and K equals to plus one. So let's do that. This is one over T plus Delta dot, dot, dot plus uh, e raised to j theta times pi times delta omega minus two pi over t minus two pi over or plus two pi over t plus delta. So this is my k equals to minus one part, then plus e raised to j theta pi delta. So 
So this is my k equals to zero term. So this is my XP of J omega. I'll let you copy it. I'm not sure how many of you are copying it, but uh, I'll just wait while you stare at this equation for some time. I have a question. Yes. Um, I didn't include the E to the J theta I just to make it easier in the beginning, is that okay? Yeah, of course, of course you can. So if there is no theta, let's assume that theta equals to zero, then there is no e raised to j theta. So you can just ignore that term completely. Okay, okay. Yeah. Any other question? Okay, no question. So let's pass it through a low pass filter with the cutoff frequency. The cutoff frequency is one over two over T plus Delta. Now the question is which of the signals will pass through in this case? Uh, So, yeah, I mean, this, this, I need to basically calculate each of these terms. Um, I'm trying to think how to best calculate it. Okay, let me just uh, use my authority to cancel out terms that I think will have very high frequency. So this term will have very high frequency. Let me use a red color. So this term will have very high frequency. This will have very high frequency, very high frequency, very high frequency. So there are essentially only two terms. One is this term, which will have low enough frequency to pass through the low pass filter. And this will have low enough frequency to pass through the low pass filter for certain values of Delta. Okay, how do I get this number? Well, I have done the thinking in the background and I've figured out that these are the only two terms that will survive after going through the low pass filter. So let's look at the frequencies that are there in these two signals. One over T plus Delta E raised to J theta times pi Delta Omega minus two pi And then I have one over T minus one over T plus Delta. So what is this? This would be Delta over T. Okay, so let me replace this with Delta over T over T plus Delta. And then I have the other term E raised to minus J theta times pi Delta omega plus two pi delta over t over t plus delta. Okay, so these are the only two terms that are going to survive when you pass it through this particular low pass filter. But for that, I want the frequencies to be less than one over two over t plus delta. So I have t plus delta as a common denominator everywhere. So this is, this is common. So I just need the numerator to be less than one over two. So I want my two pi delta over t to be less than one over two. 
for it to pass through the low pass filter, which means that delta has to be less than, what do I get? T over, T over four pi. And this is my y of j omega. So I can do the inverse Fourier transform to find y of t. So you should get the same delta in your assignment, in your solution. But just because you got this delta in your solution through a wrong argument doesn't make your answer right. You make sure that you go through exact series of steps so as to show that delta less than t over four pi means that these two signals will survive the low pass filter and will satisfy all the requirements for the cutoff frequency. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Perfect. Now you have to also extend this for A plus B cos blah, blah, blah. And I think that part is fairly straightforward. So the Fourier transform of A, which is a constant signal is A delta zero and the and B will just appear as a constant everywhere. So you will have B here and B here and so on. I'm going to remove it because I'm not considering B, but B will just be part of the coefficients everywhere. Okay, so if there are no questions, then we can adjourn for today. Thank you for all your help. Have a great weekend, guys.